Hello, and thank you very much uh, for coming to these sessions. Brent and I have been plotting together to make sure that we don't repeat each other, and also that uh, we're somewhat coordinated. Uh, I spent uh, 14 years in Australia. Um, I finished my uh, PhD in Agricultural Economics and Business here at Guelph, um, working on wine demand, and uh, ended up uh, in price analysis, and ended up doing my other field, which was resources and environment, when I got to Australia. Um, I left, uh, so I arrived there basically 2003 and pretty well worked on water policy for the whole time. And I don't know what was happening in the heavens or the hells, uh, but I ended up landing in exactly the hot spots for that whole time that I was there and I've come back here for a rest. So I don't want to see any water catastrophes here for at least two years. And, uh, and then maybe I can uh, sort of come up and see if I can help. So I, I, this is a lovely story for me to share with you, besides all of that. Um, it's a very exciting story. Um, I'm going to tell you, uh, Brent was telling you the, um, at the ground level w the actual implementation of the sort of policies that happen at the higher levels and tri trickle down. Um, I'm going to talk more from the federal overarching level and the legislative level and, 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 and give a narrative about um, the history, what came before, how they ended up in the mess they ended up in and how they're trying to get themselves out of that mess. Um, I guess I, I, I'm going to echo something that Rob Deloy said this morning. He said, um, uh, be a active in avoiding that future. And he was referring to the California mess that they're in. And we have a great opportunity here to be active in avoiding that kind of a mess. The other thing both Rob and Brent um, talked about was collaboration and being inclusive. And I w I'll try not to go off onto too many tangents, but I'm happy to talk about that and maybe in the panel discussion more. And one of the really essential things that, um, you know, you might think I'm biased because I've spent a fair bit of time in research, but I've spent as much time in my life on policy. And if we don't have the information on the, in the policy rooms, then we, we make policy that may not be as good as it could be. So we just need the kind of research that informs the policy. I don't mean research is going out studying everything under the sun as we're wont to do, but relevant research that's actually related to the kind of questions that are going to come up in five and ten years. That's what we need to be doing. Um, and I think we've, we've, had, we've had, that's what all of these sessions have been about. They're preparatory, um, baseline research, um, forecasting and predicting what we need to know with the world that we're going to be living in. Um, unlike Rob, I am going to use slides because I learn in a visual way. So, I mean, I, I might listen to somebody talk all morning and I get nothing out of it unless I get some pictures. So there'll be lots of pictures. Um, like Brent, I'll be talking about water allocation, but I'm going to the more federal level. Um, I want to tell you my six lessons that I'd like to... Um, I hope my story brings out. I'm going to tell them up front because I'll run out of time and I won't have time to <laughs> remind um, us of where I've been. So we need to learn from history and from other jurisdictions. We need binding legislation that gives us what we as a society want. And nowadays we want triple bottom line. We want everybody to agree on that. And that's what we need in our legislation. And it has to be worded so that it's so binding that nobody can wiggle out of it. We need information, the research. We need to know how to value alternative uses. And that word value is cram packed. So it's not just what I wish and what I care about and what I ethically think is right, but it's about willingness to pay. And it's about values for the environment, it's values for indigenous people, it's values in, in the whole gamut of what values means. And we need to know how to quantify those values so that when we come to the negotiating table and we have to make some hard decisions about trade-offs, we feel like we've done a good job of measuring that use 
against that use and who gets it and who doesn't. Um, we need supporting institutions. In Australia, the supporting institution that's been, two institutions been in, incredibly important in that scare system is the, uh, the water for market. So there's an invisible hand allocating water around so that we don't have to say, yes, you can grow rice, no, you can't grow rice. And so there has to be a way of allocating that through the market. So that's an institution that was essential. Um, and the other one was a robust separation of land and water. So water used to be licensed, attached to land. In the 90s, I think it was in the 90s, before my time, they separated land and water. And so land entitlement is held separately to water entitlement. So your history of use determined how much water you got. You got, uh, you got entitlements, it's not an allocation, entitlements to a certain amount of water that was based on your historical use, so many megaliters. That became an instant asset, not a free asset. It was already embodied in your overall asset, but now you've got your land value and your water value. You can trade your land, you can trade your water. And so water can go to its relatives. So those were institutions that were required. And the sixth one is you need to monitor because desperate people do desperate things. They always will. And there is water theft going on all the time. And so if you've got scarce resources, you've got to monitor. You have to have some sort of sticks. OK, now I'll start. Um, also, there's an underlying theme of collaboration and confrontation. So here's the Murray-Darling Basin. And that's come out funny. But that's the only one that came out funny. So there's two here, and there should only be one. Um, Okay, so the Mur we can work off this one. So there's the Murray-Darling Basin. It's a big thing. Um, the Darling comes down from Queensland. Down in the Southern Basin is what we call it. That's the Murray River. And I think uh, uh, this one's the Lachlan. And then there's the Murrumbidgee as well. And so the Australian Capital Territory is right here. And that's where Canberra is. Um, uh, Melbourne's down here, uh, Brisbane's sort of there, you'd see it on that one, and Sydney's over here. Sorry, we leave that over top of Ontario. Yeah, so that's over there. Oh, you know, that's a really good question. I'll Google it later. <laughs> The Murray is over 2,000 kilometers long, two to three, I think. So that gives you some, some concept. Good question. OK, so um, there's a spine of mountains here. So originally, the water flowed this way, and this was all dry in here. And this is still pretty dry. There aren't a lot of storages up there. So this was all dry. And, um, and so the way the ecology works there is that the snow melts. It goes down the rivers. It floods the banks. And that's where the trees get their drinks. So the ecology depends on overbank flooding. And then there's all the ecology that takes place in the rivers, right? And there, the rivers, the mouth of the river here down at the Coorong, sort of south uh, east of Adelaide, Adelaide's up there. So that would sometimes close up over the centuries. Um, it's just the way it worked. So in the 30s or so, um, the governments decided to work on uh, making this the food bowl. And now, I think it's 75% of the irrigated agriculture value in, Aust in Australia comes from this area. And you can imagine that, wine grapes, right? Um, so, so they decided to build big storage structures up here to catch the snow melt. And they turned the rivers eastward. They are uh, west, what way is that, westward? It's really hard coming from the southern hemisphere. I don't know why, everything seems upside down. Anyways, they turned the water to flow. To inland, and so they could open up this food bowl. 
and that started in around the 40s. But before that, there were little structures down here to hold water. So you can imagine the agriculture before all of these um, dams were built. So, you know, graziers, people who had dairy cattle or sheep or anything else, they benefited from the overland floods. They'd get this big burst of irrigation in November when everything flooded and, and you know, melted and flooded. And then once these dams were built and they were controlled, when do they need the water for grapes and citrus? They need that in January, February. And so they'd hold the water in the dams and lots would evaporate and then it would only go down when they needed it for irrigation. Never, well, very rarely would they get overbank floods, and so the environment suffers. Also, the original agricultural users suffered. And I don't remember what else was on my list, so we'll go to the next one. Um, so, this is sort of prior to um, uh, the, the major water crisis. So, this is after, after the dams have been built, so you can see agriculture, the major user of water. And you can, I won't stay here too long because I've used too much time at the beginning, but you can see some of the, the major uh, um, contributors to the gross value of irrigated agricultural production um, here. So you see your fruit and nuts and your grapes and dairy. You only get rice when water is available, so there's different kinds of water that, um, so it's general security or high security, all the horticulture's got high security water. And uh, dairy is one of the big ones. Brenda, what's high yep. security water? High security water is a license where um, if what, you get a, a first right to the water. And so the way it works is that every year they assess the, the, the authorities that manage the federal authority, the sort of overarching figures out how much water is in the dams, how much of total capacity is that. So I might have a 10 megaliter high security license, or, uh, uh, entitlement. I, uh, if, the, if the dams are full, I get 100%. If they're 90% full, I will probably get 90%. And then um, that's in general. But if I only have a general security, I might get a lesser amount than that. And so, um, and general security licenses, uh, entitlements would trade for a lower price on the market. They also can uh, uh, trade on the market temporary water. So I can, if I don't want to grow, if there's a lot of water and I don't want to grow my, um, no, if there's not very much water and therefore I don't want to grow my rice, then I'll probably lease it out to a desperate uh, grape grower that doesn't want to lose its rootstock. And so I'll get a high price. I won't bother growing relatively low value, value rice. Rice, on the other hand, in Australia, they say it's the highest, um, uh, um, most productive rice in the world because they're able to give the rice water exactly when it needs it and dry it out the rest of the time. And so unlike in Southeast Asia where it's just water all the time. Okay, so pre-2007, states territory and, and territories own and control the water. The basin includes Queensland, New South Wales, the ACT, Australian Capital Territory, Victoria, and South Australia. South Australia is a little one, but has the mouth and all the ecology at the mouth. And New South Wales is the biggest one, um, controls uh, most of the water, and also has had the worst behavior of all time in managing its water. Um, there was a collaborative water management uh, process from about 1914 on. The Murray-Darling Basin Commission was set up with representatives from everyone, including the Commonwealth. It's a collaborative process. Um, there was a cap on diversions that um, shared water between the environment and irrigated agriculture, because this is a closed system, right? It's got a scarce system. You've got one or the other. It's almost like a bunch of pipelines. Um, the National Water Initiative that Brent talked about, so a sustainability of water for both the environment and agriculture, robust separation of land and water, water entitlements were owned. Um, they agree on these annual allocations and South Australia gets a certain amount of all the water that's way upstream in the dams in New South Wales basically, but it's the system that shares across all the states. And then water trade. Um, 
a lot of allocation of water, particularly by New South Wales. This goes up to 1990. And so a lot of political favors openly accepted. Right now, New South Wales is in a huge amount of problems after all the work that's been done to fix things. They're doing backroom, government officials are doing backroom deals that's been found out through an inquiry with landholders, big landholders, and giving them water that they don't deserve and shouldn't have at all to the, to the um, detriment of the downstream users and the environment. Um, so water was licensed out excessively. Lo and behold, we run into a really bad stretch. So every year they, they, they allocate out water expecting to have some left in the dam for next year as insurance. Well, they kept doing that year after year after year and the water just never, ever got replenished. And so the, New South Wales just giving, kept giving out too much water every year and not holding back enough insurance. And so you've seen this slide before slightly different, but it's the same thing. And it was one of the last things the Murray-Darling Murray Basin Commission showed us because they had to go to the table in 2006, which when I happened to be landed in the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet as a water advisor, um, the Murray-Darling Basin Commission had to go with their tail between their legs and say, we're out of water, the dams are dry. And so, this isn't that unusual in Australia, but it's quite dramatic after that. Um, this is a riverbed, this is ephemeral, this happens, this is in Queensland. But it can happen in New South Wales and South Australia. That's a Kelpie. I have one, they're wonderful dogs, but they're... <laughs> and the water, and here we are. This is for the farmers in the room. I don't necessarily know what all these things do, but you probably do. They're moving water from one thing to another. This is the other thing about Australia. You hear about the flooding in the middle of Australia. Well, it happens because it's flat as a pancake. There's nowhere for the water to go, and so it just covers the land. It might only be that deep, but you'll get flooded out. This is right near... Um, uh, Canberra, it's the Murrumbidgee River Valley, so it's uh, flowing south into those storages. And you look at that in Canada and you go, oh, that looks cold. It gets hot as a bathtub in the summer. Up in the mountains, you wouldn't know we've got snow, but this is uh, in, the, in the Mount Kosciuszko National Park. Um, this part of what melts, and here's one of the storages up in the mountains, formed by big dams. And this dam is the Hume Dam. It's down um, at the foot of the mountain. So we've got the big storages up there and then other storages. This is the biggest storage down low. Um, built in, I thought it was the 30s, but what I was looking at today said 49, so I don't know. Um, in that era, anyways. So that's what it looks like on a good day. It's not what it looked like in 2007. This is what it looks like in a good day, too. That's what it looked like in 2007. So these were all beautiful farmlands that were flooded by the, by the building of the dams in order to hold the water. And we're, this is below the, the outtake pipes. So it literally was zero. Thank you. More of the same. You see cracked earth like this all the time. It get, you get used to it. Oh, and this is like a previous forest that you see there that's been submerged for decades. That's a good day. It's an old river meandering along. This is a, a, a portion of the river that's uh, in Victoria. Uh, it's the Barma Forest, so it's a protected area. High recreation values and indigenous values, a lot of recreation. You know, they get all excited about these muddy rivers. I don't know. But they're warm and they're nice. But there's a huge amount of, like, bank erosion, all, all, just the problems go. And, and um, what they did in the 30s is they took out what they call snags. They took out all the 
uh, the branches and trees that had flowed downstream and then they found out, well, that's the breeding ground for all the Murray cod, this iconic cod that lives, you know, natural, um, uh, naturally occurring fish and so they've had to put them all back now. Um, I took that photo, that's at one of my research areas along the river. Picnic Point, they call it. Um, again, South Australia, Manum. So you can, you can see all the, it almost looks like feudalism, doesn't it? Um, uh, near Renmark, I think, Red Cliffs or something they call it. Yeah, beautiful. Um, this is another one of my research areas. So this is the mouth of the Murray, here, there. And there's a long um, lagoon system called the Coorong um, that uh, the, the mouth of the Murray was closed during that period of the millennial drought, they had to have big dredging machines here to keep pulling the sand out because the, the ecology was being so damaged because with a closed mouth, there's not enough water coming down the river. Um, it became hypersaline and everything was dying, except I found out much later the fishermen quite liked it because the sharks that stayed in there were actually better fish to catch than the ones that they were getting before. It messed up my values, I'm sure. Anyway, so here's another picture of the Coorong. So it's 100 kilometers long, an aerial view. Um, so the value of a crisis. What you end up getting is a policy window. And you get the right people in the room who are competing with it for attention with each other and everybody wants to one-up themselves. And somebody comes to my desk one day and says, Brenda, how much water should we buy back for the environment? I said, I just got here. <laughs> I'm not quite sure about that. So I called my friends who were in the research community and I said, I, I didn't tell them why I was that. Well, I had called one friend. I said, so there's been a lot of research done, and luckily there was. There had been a huge amount of research on the, on the southern system, the, um, the Murray, um, called the Living Murray Initiative to find out how much water was actually required for all these special iconic sites, like some of the ones I've shown you already, um, how much water was actually required for that environmental condition to be sustained or even improved. And so he went, but he's a real research type, didn't even ask me why I asked from the Prime Minister's <coughs> office how much water we might need in the Murray in the middle of a crisis. But anyways, he went away and he came back with a number that I was sort of playing around with. And it was almost literally on the back of an envelope. And I said, we need, we need um, at least 1,500 gigaliters. Um, at a, probably an average of $2,000 a megaliter, that gives me $3 billion. So I wrote the briefing note on one page to the Prime Minister and said, $3 billion, please, and he said, okay. And then I came back from Christmas vacation and there was another $6 billion to upgrade individuals' irrigation infrastructure. I went, no, 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 that's not how we do it. Anyway, so that's, they bought, they bought the agreement of the state. So this is what happens up there if we don't do something down here. $10 billion. So that was the value that was placed on the, um, on the water to improve the environmental condition, which comes out of taxpayer money. MDBC, the Commission Collaborative System, failed us. And so what we also got happening was the federal government what argued for and got responsibility for water. So in Australia, it's the same as Canada. The states and territories have control over resources. But it, for water, because they had failed, they handed it over to the feds and said, here, you fix it. And that's what that, um, five, that $6 billion was for, was to buy one of the state's agreement on that. I don't know why the feds wanted it, but anyways, they did. One of the most important and most world-class things that happened that I was totally against at the time was including this word optimize in the triple bottom line. I said, everybody's got a different idea of what optimize means. We'll just be arguing nonstop. The scientists, the social scientists, and the economists, it's going to be a nightmare. And it was 
but it forced us to talk to each other, so it was the best thing that ever happened. The, the Ontario legislation does not force optimization. It's worded almost the same, but it doesn't force optimization. I would recommend that that be put in there. Whoops, I keep going for the machine. Okay, so I'm, how long do I have? You have uh, just about seven minutes. Okay. Um, I'm going to use most of that because I think we'll end up discussing during the panel. Is, are, is every, does everybody agree? Do you want to hear the rest of this story? Yeah? Okay, good. So um, this is a production possibility frontier. So if we put all of our resources in, into the environment, we get that. If we put them all into agriculture, we get that. So we have to decide where are we going to go. If we prefer agriculture, we'll do this much agriculture. If we prefer the environment, we'll do that much environment. Where do we go? Well. This was tricky. Before the crisis, we used to say the, the greenies would say we want to be here, the irrigators would say we want to be here, and they'd say, well, we don't want to give up this because we don't think that's worth it, and then we had less water. So there was a huge game change with the water crisis. So this whole production possibility got shifted in. We didn't have enough water to get way out to here in maximum agriculture, or max much, maximum environment. And in fact, if we stay here, if, if we try to continue at that amount of irrigated agriculture at D, as we had when we had this much water, we don't get that much environment, we lose environment because water is having to go out of the environment and into irrigated agriculture. So here we've got the concepts of scarcity from the point of view of how an economist would think about it. This is my scarcity constraint. I can't get, any fr I can't get out there anymore, there's less water. I've got um, a choice to make. Well, obviously, we're not going to give up this much of the environment. So we're going to have to give up some agriculture. So we move on to this new graph. We don't stay at B. We move on to this new constraint, and we go, well, we'll give up a little bit of water to irrigated agriculture, and we'll put that into an environmental bank. You'll pay us for it. Pay us for that water on the water market, and we did, on average, $2,000 a megaliter, to only willing sellers had to sell that and what the people who sold it were the people who had the less productive farms, the least profitable farms because they could make a lot of money on the market of, for water. They made more money selling water than continuing in agriculture. So, and then all the productive um, producers were happy because the low end guys were gone. That's just the set the blunt reality of how it worked. And so what we got instead is not this huge reduction in the amount of um, the environment that um, we, we, we would have gotten with staying at B, we get a lesser reduction. We still get a reduction. So we lose this much irrigated agriculture, but we get back, we trade off and get some more environment back by putting water into this environmental water bank. Is that, is that good? So the way it worked, the Murray-Darling Basin Authority was created to replace the commission under the Water Act, and they were told, go out there, figure it out on a triple bottom line point of view. So find out what the environmental impact is of taking even one megaliter out of irrigated agriculture and put it into the environment and tell me how much is actually needed. Do it on a triple line basis. Go talk to everybody in the community. Make sure that social values, environmental values, and economic values are all optimized. And this is what they came up with. Quite a bit more than my estimate, but it ends up not having cost anymore. But So out in the irrigated agriculture land, they say, Prove to me that the loss of 4%, sorry, 13% in the value of irrigated agriculture is actually returned to society in terms of the benefits. And of course, we don't know. We paid $10 billion for that in Australia. Are those benefits worth it? Of course, you'll say, well, you can't run 
a society or agriculture at all if you have a completely depleted environment. So in the limit, of course it's worth it, but at the margin, is it worth it? I don't know. So lots of, lots of questions. The local level was cranky, miserable. Of course now the feds are in control, so they complained a lot. The squeaky wheel gets the grease, and so everybody complained. Um, and I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing, because that's the way it was done. The biggest problem was the knowledge gaps. Have we actually done the best thing for society? Should we have put that $10 billion into hospitals and schools? How much of a water bank do we actually need? What is the value of this trade-off? Is it too much to spend or too little to spend? Those are all questions you can't answer unless you know what the value of these trade-offs really are. And that requires research. And if you don't have it done ahead of time and you end up in a crisis, you don't get it done. And you get people like me being handed this question and I do the best that I can with my limited resources. Um, and you know, it's really tricky to figure out what the values are because everything on the environment side is a non-market valuation. It's all non-market. The, the irrigator can tell you, I will lose $20 million if you take that and you go grow gum trees. Tell me that those gum trees are worth $20 million. Can't. So there are some ways, and I went out and did this before the water crisis. So I went out and I calculated non-market values at two sites. I showed you the two sites using th three methods. And what I found, those of you who like demand curves can look at that. Otherwise, just look at the picture. And so what I found was that the non-market value of recreation, one teensy bit of the total non-market value of environmental goods and services was worth $57 million. That was equal to, just so that you see it's non-trivial, all of dairy profits for the whole of the Murray-Darling Basin. And that's one little teensy bit. We're not talking bequ bequeath values, existence values, indigenous values, everything else. So the cost of a crisis creates opportunities. But if you lead the policy development and do the research ahead of time, you'll make much better decisions without a lot of cranky, angry burning of policy documents. The, Aust the Canadian uh, Ontario legislation pr should probably be tightened up. Get that optimized word in that I didn't like before. Um, and thank you very much. I hope it's informative. <laughs> One minute. People see the water is being, ownership of water is being concentrated in the hands of the most powerful. Do you mean in the hands of a few irrigators? Yes. Well, if you, oh, I did a lot of field work talking to people. Um, indigenous people are probably going between despondent and militant over it. Um, There, were, there was no complaining at all about $10 billion going into buying water for the environment to create an environmental water bank. And that's because the housewives, I can say that, um, live in the big cities on the perimeter. And all this was happening in the interior where almost nobody lives. And so everyone out here goes, oh, I love pelicans. I love those iconic gum trees. Yes, we need more water for the environment. But there, there still is the, it's the same as anywhere in the world. You can go to Europe, Canada, anywhere, and everybody loves the farm sector. 
they still see farms as family farms. They don't realize that farms are not just family farms anymore. And they don't want to lose that. They want to drive in the countryside and see farming. They do not want to lose it. And so, I'm not really answering your question. That, that sort of issue is, was not the main issue. It was still pretty, pretty polarized. The green movement, the environmental support, which includes the housewives, and the irrigation lobby. The irrigation lobby is extremely powerful in Australia. So it's between those two and the distraction, isn't that how it always goes? The distraction is we're both fighting the feds. It's Australians are so, I didn't even know what wedge politics was until I got there. They really know how to get, how to wedge people against others and how to divert the conversation. What else? I can't help but think of the U.S problems that they had with the Mexicans on the Rio Grande. Headwaters are in the U.S. plains and the, the water, Mexico had a historical rate of water and they got just a trickle. There are, there's people living downstream of the Warren uh, Darling River that depend on that water supply. Mm -hmm. And they're going to be denied it. Someone's going to have to say, sorry. Well, first, first right to water does go to urban and um, stock, so cattle and sheep. So first right goes to them. And then, and then the allocation is decided for the rest, for the irrigated agriculture. And now the water bank for the environment is set aside. And what happened when they set aside that water bank was you take, in any market, you take a big su supply out and take it away from the market, you force the price up. So all the price, the water became even more valuable and a lot of those lower value producers left. It's, um, it's more of the wealth concentrated in the hands of a few and the control and the power. Um, I, I don't think people think that there's anything they can do about it and they don't think that it affects them. So if food becomes too expensive, they buy imports. And so that's something happening over there not affecting me in my kitchen. 